Welcome to another episode of Cal's Corner Radio Show here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. My name is Cal Korf, and I'm your host, and the executive producer of the show is, once again, the legendary Rob McConnell. Folks, I'd like to thank you for tuning in, and let's get to the two topics for today's show. As we always talk about here on Cal's Corner, uh, we cover everything from politics to the paranormal. So today we're going to talk about international politics and international affairs. We're going to focus on two very important subjects which should concern everybody, even if you don't care about politics. The first thing is the tensions recently um, and the military uh, back and forth or actions that occurred between the Jewish state of Israel and the rogue nation of Iran, which, of course, is the world's largest sponsor of terrorism. We'll talk about that, the Iranian nuclear agreement, and we will prove that the Iranians have already broken that agreement. We, uh, it is yet to be seen what the consequences of that is now going to be. Uh, there's a different president now in the White House. It's no longer Barack Obama, who is arguably too passive where it concerned Iran. And then we'll segue to another very important subject, which is the uh, release by the communist Chinese of their new stealth fighter, which is literally an existential threat not only to the country of India, but to peace and stability around the world. So let's talk about Iran and Israel uh, real quick. Now, as people will remember, American President Barack Obama and his then Secretary of State, John Kerry, brokered a so-called nuclear deal with Iran, which they claim falsely, because they're not telling the truth, they've always lied about the Iranian nuclear deal, and we'll prove that in a few minutes here. They claim that this deal prevents Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. That's nonsense. To be very blunt about this issue, Iran can develop nuclear weapons anytime it wants to. Okay? I'm going to repeat what I just said. Anytime Iran wants to develop a nuclear weapon, they can do it. There is absolutely nothing, I repeat, nothing that is stopping them from doing it. The only reason Iran has not developed a finished nuclear warhead yet that we know of, because we can't prove that they haven't done it already, is because they're making too much money now, essentially being bribed and paid off, to stay legal, to stay within the international law, to not develop rogue nuclear weapons. In other words, Iran is a signatory to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, or NPT. Under the terms of the NPT, any country that signs that agreement, they're given, in exchange for the promise not to develop nuclear weapons, they're given access to nuclear technology. And this program was essentially started under the Atoms for Peace program by President Dwight Eisenhower. And the reason that that program was created in the 50s is because the former Soviet Union, when it used to be communism, uh, communist rather, uh, was giving nuclear technology to some of its satellite countries so that they could develop nuclear weapons and the Russians could proliferate the spread of nukes around the world, the U.S., created the uh, Atoms for Peace program because they thought, well, it's better that um, these other countries uh, that are not aligned with Russia be aligned with the U.S. instead. And if we don't give them access to uh, atomic energy and those technologies, then, of course, they're going to get them from the Russians, and that wouldn't be good for the world. So that's a short version of how that program uh, was created and what its history is. So let's talk about the Iranian nuclear agreement here. I have said for years now, and as a longtime journalist, I've also exposed many lies that former American President Barack Obama and former Secretary of State John Kerry have said about the Iranian nuclear deal. They've always lied about it to the global public, and shame on them for doing so. Because if they want the support by the American people and the world behind this agreement, they're at least obligated to tell the truth. But they've always lied about it. So let me prove that very briefly here before we get into China. Now, as I've mentioned before, there's a huge difference between what American President Barack Obama was busy claiming about the details of his proposed deal with Iran versus the facts. To put this issue bluntly, Obama has been busy 
he was busy when he was president, actively and deliberately lying to the world about the Iranian nuclear agreement's contents. Now, what I'm going to do is summarize for you a very short list of his falsehoods and provide facts that prove that Obama did lie about it. This is also true with Secretary of State John Kerry. Again, he was a Secretary of State at that time during the Obama administration. So let's start with his speech that um, Obama gave on the Iranian agreement at American University on the 5th of August in 2015. Now, this is a quote from Obama. He says, after two years of negotiations, we have achieved a detailed arrangement that permanently keyword permanently here, folks, prohibits Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. It cuts off all of Iran's pathways to a bomb. It contains the most comprehensive inspection and verification regime ever negotiated to monitor a nuclear program. Now, when I heard that statement, I thought, does Obama and Kerry really think that the world is that stupid? First of all, it is not the most rigorous inspection regime ever in the history of monitoring nuclear programs. Think about the country of Iraq. In Iraq, they had inspectors on the ground that could do what are called snap inspections. And in a snap inspection means they're just going to show up and say, show me this. And Iraq had to do it. And Iraq did. They tried to avoid a war that George Bush later started when he invaded that country. Now, there are no SNAP inspections at all going on in Iran. Uh, part of the deal, the Iranian nuclear deal, prohibits them. The Iranians said, no, we will not agree to this, and Obama and Kerry caved. So Obama's claim is a blatant lie. It's a gross exaggeration. In other words, it's pure nonsense. So Obama lied at least one time in each of those three sentences that he said – which is outright shameful. It is beneath the dignity of the office of the President of the United States. Obama's first false claim is that the agreement, quote, permanently prohibits Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon, unquote. In reality, the agreement does no such thing. It was never intended to do any such thing. The Iranians would never have agreed to such an agreement. Now, the word permanent means, according to the dictionary, Quote, everlasting and eternal. That means it goes on forever, okay? The opposite of the word permanent is temporary. So Obama and Kerry's Iran deal has a maximum shelf life of 15 years with most of its protections, as Obama euphemistically calls them, ending within a decade. 10 to 15 years is nowhere near permanently. Think about it, folks. The logic here is obvious, unless you're Barack Obama. So what's next? By this type of dishonest, twisted logic, it's possible to be just a little bit pregnant. And of course it's not. So Obama's second lie in the second sentence of his statement was when he said, quote, it cuts off all of Iran's pathways to a bomb. No, the agreement does not. Iran can continue to lie and cheat, as it always has done, concerning its nuclear weapons program ever since its radical, hate-driven ayatollahs took over the country. Iran can easily do this by simply using secret facilities that only Iran knows exists. Most of the country, meaning Iran, will not be open to inspections, not even past nuclear weapons-related facilities, which Iran has used to get away with cheating over the decades. For example, there's a military facility in Iran where we know for a fact that they were doing miniature nuclear warhead miniaturization tests. That facility, even today, is still off-limits to inspectors. So what's going on there? We don't know. That's not transparency not at all. <laughs> Not even by, you would think, Obama and Kerry standards. Now, the third lie in the third sentence um, that Obama spoke at that speech was when he falsely claimed, quote, it, the agreement, contains the most comprehensive inspection and verification regime ever negotiated to monitor a nuclear program. 
Well, even Obama must know that this is not true, and here's why. Not only will no SNAP inspections be allowed, they're not allowed at all, the cameras that are used to record Iran's so-called compliance at various monitored facilities aren't even live cameras. There's no live imagery. Instead, there's only a videotape that is later submitted to UN inspectors to watch after the fact. Now, by contrast, even in agreements reached with communist North Korea, which felled under Bill Clinton, let's be clear, the cameras were live. Under the terms negotiated with former Iraqi dictator Saddam Hussein, the video feeds were also live. Now, are Obama and his speechwriters this ignorant of basic history? It's highly unlikely. His claim instead is a brazen lie. Let's call it what it is, folks. I don't like calling anybody a liar, let alone the former president of the United States, but I'm not going to mince words on this. The last thing we can do is try to be politically correct. We have to call a spade a spade, as they say. So Obama then says, quote, there will be 24-7 monitoring of Iran's key nuclear facilities. For decades, inspectors will have access to Iran's entire nuclear supply chain from the uranium mines and the mills and where they get the raw materials for centrifuge production and where they make the machines to enrich it. Now, we'll come back after the station break and prove that this claim is also a lie. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the Exxon Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Gwilda Wiaka's latest book, The Science of Magic, Book of Mysteries, Volume 1, is the first book in a series based on her writings that open every episode of the Science of Magic radio show. Drawing on the subject matter of each guest, and armed with over 40 years' experience in shamanism, 35 years in alternative health, and degrees in psychology and religious studies, Wilda introduces relevant and leading-edge information that supports spiritual evolution and personal empowerment. Rich with wisdom and inspirational quotes packaged in digestible segments, this is a book that will pull you from cover to cover. It will also serve as a daily inspirational reading for years to come. The Science of Magic Book of Mysteries, Volume 1, is available at our website, tsompublications.com, amazon.com, and wherever fine books are sold. Back in Victorian England, a famous theologian posed a perplexing riddle. Why are the two top personalities in the Bible tagged with the numbers 7 and 11? Academics agree the answer is found in the stunning discovery of a hitherto secret Bible structure explained in a new book called The Genesis Grid. The discovery is so simple that preschool children could illustrate it. Certain claims are hugely controversial and may offend some, but at the X-Zone, we've studied this awesome new book and agree with one expert, and I quote, These discoveries appear to be beyond coincidence. So who or what hid this wonderful pattern in the Bible, and what might they do next? Find out more, X-Zone Nation, and read reviews on www.genesisgrid.co.uk. That's www.genesisgrid.co.uk. (laughs) 
Welcome back to segment two here on Cow's Corner Radio Show on the X Zone Broadcast Network. My name is Cal Korf, and I'm your host and the executive producer of the show. Once again, is Rob McConnell. Now we were talking about Barack Obama and John Kerry's lies. That's the only way to accurately and truthfully describe some of their comments that they've made about the Iran nuclear deal, lies that they deliberately stated to the world to try to sell the world on what has always been and only been a very bad deal. And we'll come back to that point near the end of this segment here on Iran. So getting back to exposing yet another one of Obama's lies, and again, John Kerry at that time parroted these remarks, so he's just as guilty. Obama said, quote, there will be 24-7 monitoring of Iran's key nuclear facilities. For decades, inspectors will have access to Iran's entire nuclear supply chain from the uranium mines and mills where they get raw materials to the centrifuge production facilities where they make machines to enrich it. Now, it's interesting that Obama should say for decades when the entire agreement is only good for a maximum of 15 years and most of the terms expire in 10. Well, the last time I checked, a decade was 10 years. Decades would be 20 or more years. Obama, I guess, probably didn't do well as a math student. I, I, other than that, he, again, is lying about what he just said. So while Obama says that this monitoring will be 24-7, Obama deliberately omits the important credibility-destroying caveat, meaning he omits this detail that destroys his credibility on what he just said, that, again, these are not live feed cameras. This is an important distinction, because without live feeds, live video feeds, Iran can cheat. The dynamic of this is beyond obvious, folks. Think about it. Now, Obama also lied when he said that inspectors will have access to Iran's entire nuclear supply chain. Now, as I previously exposed as a journalist years ago when I wrote about this, this is not logically possible unless one is genuinely psychic and no human being is. And it's, this is because of the only reason that ultimately matters. Only Iran truly knows what its entire nuclear supply chain really is. Had Obama and the rest of the international intelligence community ever fully understood Iran's supply chain, there's a very good chance that during the watchful eyes of Obama, uh, Iran would never have reached nuclear weapons breakout point, which it did. In other words, Obama for years used to puff his chest and brag about these tough sanctions against Iran. They were so tough, folks, that they never prevented Iran from reaching the breakout point of being able to make nuclear weapons anytime they wanted to, and they're still at that point. In fact, they've refined methodologies to the degree that they can make a bomb anytime they want to. And when I say bomb, I mean a nuclear weapon, of course. So, despite these unprecedented sanctions, as Obama used to euphemistically call them, that Obama loved to brag about, uh, none of them prevented Iran from acquiring everything it needed to go rogue nuclear anytime it wanted to. Absolutely nothing. This is also true with North Korea. North Korea continues to refine, improve, and perfect, and further advance its nuclear weapons. Under Obama... North Korea made the greatest advances in its nuclear weapons program. Now, it became a nuclear power under George Bush, but under the entire eight years that Bush was in office and the entire eight years that Obama was in office, North Korea wasn't stopped. Sure, the toughest sanctions ever levied against it were imposed by both presidents, but none of them worked. And sanctions that don't work are not sanctions worth anything. If I am trying to cure a disease and I give you a cure that doesn't work, it's useless. I might as well not bother. And that is exactly what has happened with Iran and North Korea. Now, we must remember that it was Obama himself who repeatedly gave countries like India and China waivers so that they continued to buy oil from Iran and Iran would use that cash to fuel its rogue nuclear weapons program. 
That's an example, those two examples, of how tough the sanctions were. Obama would impose these so-called tough sanctions against Iran, but then give India and communist China exemptions that allowed them to buy oil, which they still do to this day, from Iran, giving Iran uh, badly needed hard currency, and it would use some of that money to further fuel its rogue nuclear weapons program. Now, what, what type of sanity is that where you permit loopholes that totally destroy what you're trying to do? It's, it's just bizarre, folks, but that's what Obama did. Now, had Iran's leadership bothered to use the money to better take care of its own people instead of building more uranium enrichment centrifuges, Iran's economy and standard of living would be far better than it is. But they didn't. They used it to further their nuclear weapons program and their support of Hezbollah, the terrorist group, and of course Hamas, the terrorist group, because Iran remains to this day, as of this broadcast, the world's largest sponsor of terrorism. So Obama also said, quote, under the terms of the deal, inspectors will have the permanent ability to inspect any suspicious sites in Iran. Now, again, that is a blatant lie, folks. It's the only way to put it. There is absolutely nothing in the Iran agreement that says any such thing that Obama is talking about. And you can look it up. In fact, under the agreement, Iran can refuse any requested inspections and 24 days notice is required. Now think about that. If you and inspectors want to check out a facility and Iran says, no, you can't do that. They have to give 24 days notice. That's over three weeks. That means that they have plenty of time to move around whatever equipment or hide whatever they want to to avoid being caught. And if Iran doesn't agree after 24 days notice to open that facility for inspection, then it the, the issue goes before a committee, and you know how that can get when you're involving the United Nations, and it will take four countries from that committee to vote to agree that Iran should let inspectors in. And if Iran still refuses, according to the terms of this agreement, which Kerry and Obama said was, you know, the best deal they could get, which is ridiculous, Iran can declare the whole agreement null and void, and then everyone loses. There's a stalemate. Nothing gets done. So this fact and these few facts that I have exposed about Obama's lies and John Kerry's lies about the Iran nuclear agreement redefine the word tough with the additional proviso. And, and by the way, this, this is how we're going to end the segment here. There's one last condition in the Iran nuclear agreement that says that no Americans are permitted to be any part of the inspection team. It's called the Great Satan Clause, and that's how ridiculous this agreement is. Now, I remember very distinctly, because I had these debates with people on social media on my Facebook page, which is open to the public. You can see it at facebook.com slash cal, K-A-L, dot corf, K-O-R-F-F. It's an open page. Anybody can see it. I remember Lala left-wing liberals and Obama supporters, and Democrats especially, saying, well, Israel's wrong. Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, the Israeli prime minister, is wrong in opposing the Iranian deal. And I disagreed with that, and I still do to this day, and I think I've been vindicated now, although I wish I was wrong on this issue. I want to remind everybody, especially my so-called critics, that I don't have an ego in any of this. I don't mind being wrong. In fact, it has been my observation in my short life that being wrong is sometimes one of the best teachers you can have in life. I've seen it in other people. And I've certainly experienced it myself. Sometimes it's painful. But the important thing is that you learn and then you move forward. You move on. So Netanyahu's objection to the Iranian deal was that it didn't eliminate, because it doesn't, Iran's 
ability to make a nuclear weapon. Because we must remember that Iran is an existential threat to the Jewish state of Israel. They have an official holiday called Jerusalem Day, where they celebrate the so-called liberation of Jerusalem from the Jews. Iran always says death to America, death to Israel. The U.S. is the great Satan. Israel is the little Satan. So Netanyahu is right when he says that he takes very seriously threats by other nations when they threaten to annihilate Israel. Well, why wouldn't you take those seriously? If somebody comes up to you or the official foreign policy of a country is, I'm going to wipe you out and I'm developing nuclear bombs to do it, you have to take it seriously or you are an idiot and a moron and you don't belong in power. And Jews of all people on this world know what it's like to be a victim of the Holocaust. Remember it from World War II. So now we come to the present conflict between Israel and Iran. We'll come back and discuss that in a moment after the break and prove that Iran has now broken the terms of the Iranian deal. And of course, nobody's doing anything yet about their violations. Broadcast studios in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada, to the world and beyond. You're watching the Exxon Broadcast Network, www.xzbn.net. ABS Media Day. The scientist and the mystic have been on an age-old, relentless search with one thing in common. They seek truth. Their paths converge in the 40,000-year-old practice of shamanism, an ancient science delving to the quantum level of life, facilitating healing, manifestation, and evolution. I'm Gwilda Wiecka, the founder and director of Path Home Shamanic Arts School, a unique Colorado State-certified occupational school, training shamanic practitioners and teachers. We also provide classes for empowering personal lives through shamanism. Our certification classes are in week-long segments, enabling international participation, and online classes and long-distance shamanic healing sessions are available. Come discover the science of magic in the limitless world of shamanism. www.findyourpathhome.com Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the X-Zone Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere. 24-7-365. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnick's author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God. It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God. And finally, after the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. 
For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Welcome back to the third segment here on Cal's Corner Radio Show. My name is Cal Korf, and I'm your host. The executive producer of the show is Rob McConnell. Now, folks, in the first two segments, I've proven to you by any reasonable objective standard, that's my view, that former American President Barack Obama and his Secretary of State John Kerry outright lied about certain parts of the Iranian nuclear deal. Why they did it, you'd have to ask them. If they follow their past patterns of predictability, they'll deny they lied, even though there's no question that they have. I am one of a few journalists who bothered to expose their lies while disgustingly, in my view, uh, most of my fellow journalist peers and colleagues, la la left wing liberals who support Obama blindly, went ahead and just didn't address the fact he lied or they just ignored it. And that is, again, inexcusable for any credible journalist to avoid exposing lies by political leaders. They're not serving the public. They're serving an agenda instead, and journalists are not supposed to do that. Now, let's talk about what Iran has done today, and this was very predictable. They have now broken the terms of the Iranian nuclear deal, and let me prove it. Under the Iranian nuclear deal, Iran is not allowed to develop missiles that are capable of carrying nuclear warheads. Again, they're not allowed to develop missiles that carry nuclear warheads. Now, a few years ago, and I exposed this years ago as a journalist, Iran tried to get around this limitation by not developing ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles. And those are missiles that have a range of 5,000 kilometers or greater. Instead, what they did is they were focusing on cruise missiles. Now, cruise missiles are different from ICBMs because ICBMs go up into the atmosphere in a uh, flight trajectory that is an arc, okay? Some of them will go so high that they actually go into space, and what they do is they stay up in space for a while. While the Earth rotates its target and brings it underneath it, then the rocket falls back to Earth and hits the target using the rotation of the Earth uh, as an assistant, if you will, to make the targeting uh, easier and it saves on uh, fuel that is necessary to propel that rocket if the Earth is going to rotate and bring the target closer so that when the rocket drops down, it can then hit the target. So ICBMs tend to go in a trajectory that is an arc. Cruise missiles, on the other hand, follow the terrain of the uh, ground. They can literally fly just a few feet above the ground very fast speeds, they can't be detected on most radar systems, and they hug the terrain of uh, wherever it is they're flying. They can go in canyons, they can go over buildings without hitting them, and their trajectory can be changed while in flight by their controllers. So what Iran was doing is Iran was uh, working on developing a nuclear-capable cruise missile, and they would tell the United States, and they did, we're not violating the Iranian nuclear agreement because it's not an ICBM. Now, technically, that's true. But shame on John Kerry and shame on Obama for not fleshing out that section of the agreement that gave Iran just enough wriggle room so that they could cheat. In other words, because Kerry and Obama cowered to Iran – and refused to budge on that issue, meaning they refused to uh, rein in Iran tight enough so that they couldn't develop cruise missiles that were capable of carrying nuclear weapons. Both sides agreed to disagree. Iran moved forward, and to this day, it seems like they have, based on intelligence reports that have been published as of even two years ago. They basically have achieved the technical capability to make a cruise missile that can carry a miniaturized nuclear warhead. And we know beyond dispute that they were uh, conducting miniaturization warhead tests at the Nataz facility in Iran. 
They were also doing this at two other locations that we know of. There's, it's reasonable to assume there may be others that we don't know of because, again, the entire country is not open for inspections. Only a handful of facilities are. Now, you might say, well, if Iran was free to do this because the agreement wasn't locked down, they're not really guilty of cheating. And I can understand from a lawyer technical standpoint that argument is valid. But now let me give you a little piece of evidence that proves unquestionably that Iran has lied and cheated, and they've done it just a few days ago. And, of course, the la-la left-wing liberal media who hates Donald Trump isn't really covering this issue and shame on them. There's no excuse. This should be front-page news, but it's not. What has Iran done? Iran recently held, just days ago, their latest Look How Tough We Are military parade. And guess what they showed in this military parade, folks? They showed off a new class of ICBMs that are absolutely, unquestionably, undeniably capable of delivering nuclear weapons. They're not supposed to do this, but they have. So that's how tough this Iran nuclear agreement is. Iran is mocking the civilized world by laughing all the way to the bank. And one big objection that I have against the agreement is it's basically a bribe and a payoff. And let me prove it. Now, imagine you're Iran or any country. Let's say you're the ruler of that country, and you decide you want to make rogue nuclear weapons in violation of the NPT treaty that you signed saying you'd never do such a thing. Then all of a sudden, the United States comes to you in the form of Barack Obama and John Kerry and says, hey, please don't make nuclear weapons. I'll tell you what. We'll give you over $100 billion not to make your nukes. We'll give you back the money that we froze years ago when you had the nerve to take our embassy people hostage and hold them for 444 days, violating all laws. We're going to pay you not to make nukes. Well, that's a tough gig if you can get it. Imagine how messed up this world would be. Imagine how dysfunctional this world would be if we paid people not to break the laws. And that's exactly what we're doing with Iran. We're paying them billions of dollars to not break the law. Now, if that is not insanity, nothing is. So what has happened recently is Iran, as it continues to test the patience and determination of the international community, what it's done is it has it sent a drone that violated Israeli airspace. And this was not a, a typical drone for Iran. It was a new class of drones that is a game changer entirely. The first thing is you must remember that a couple years ago, the Iranians intercepted, with the help of the Russians, an American stealth drone. They were able to successfully land it on Iranian soil, take it over electronically. They reverse engineered it. And guess what? That drone, that knockoff version that Iran has now made, is the drone that violated Israeli airspace. The Israelis did pick it up on their radar because they have some of the best radar in the world. They lead the world in signal intelligence, actually. They share their technologies with the United States. They detected the drone. They sent up Apache helicopters, shot it down. They were able to prove that it was a knockoff of the captured and stolen American drone from years ago when Obama was president. And then what did Israel do? Israel did what it always did. It retaliated. So what Israel did is they launched some fighter aircraft. They destroyed the launching facility, which was located in Syria. A plane of theirs was shot down, but it was shot down over Israeli territory. The pilots ejected safely. They're fine. The plane was lost. So maybe next time Israel uses joint strike fighters instead. And, of course, there's nothing that uh, Syria can do in response to that because they don't have a good counter to the joint strike fighter, whereas the F-16 that the Israelis use, that's kind of old, outdated technology. It's kind of surprising that Israel used uh, a plane that's now considered to be primitive compared to the joint strike fighter. But the point is no Israeli pilots were lost. Iran's facilities were destroyed. 
And Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has told Iran and warned the world that Iran is slowly militarizing Syrian territory to further its regional hegemony goals and, of course, try to attack Israel through its proxies, the terrorist group Hezbollah, and, of course, they support Hamas on occasion as well. And that's the reality of what's going on. Again, the main reason that Netanyahu and Israel objected to the Iranian nuclear deal is Israel wanted to see all of Iran's nuclear bomb-making facilities permanently destroyed. Now, permanently in the definition that the dictionary defines it, not Barack Obama, which is only for 10 or 15 years at the most. That's not permanent. That's temporary. There's nothing wrong with that request. If you want to stop a rogue nuclear weapons program, you destroy the capability to make such weapons, period, full stop. That's how you solve the problem. So it wasn't a case of Israel trying to impose its will or you know, any other nonsense excuse that has been used to smear them. They wanted the issue solved. Just like somebody wants a real cure for a disease, they don't want a temporary Band-Aid. They want the thing solved. That is Israel's position today, and Israel is right to hold that position. Now, that's all we're going to talk about for Iran. What's going to happen is Iran is going to continue to push the will and patience of the international community. It remains to be seen how the world responds to it. I predict it'll be too little too late, and there is a very good risk going forward that in the next couple of years, there may indeed be a war that breaks out. Now, after we come back from the station break here, we're going to talk about Communist China, its recent deployment into combat operations of its new stealth fighter, and why why that is an existential threat to world peace. We'll be back after this commercial break. My name is Cal Korf. Again, this is Cal's Corner Radio Show. Named one of the world's greatest psychics, Elizabeth Joyce is now giving readings worldwide via Skype. Elizabeth Joyce is recognized for her clairvoyant ability to help find missing persons, her analysis of dreams, past life regression work, mediumship, and her accurate predictions. Elizabeth has been a frequent guest on the Exxon Radio Show with yours truly, Rob McConnell, now for several years. For an appointment with Elizabeth Joyce, call 201-934-8986 or Skype at elizabeth.joyce. And for more information, you can always visit Elizabeth Joyce online at www.new-visions.com. The new nonfiction book, Razor of Madness, is similar to cult movies like Clockwork Orange, Dragon's Tattoo, or The Other Side of Hell. Wayne Morin Jr. and Thomas Lee Howe will expose widespread and systematic deficiencies in this thought-provoking tell-all novel. Mind control rages among scholars in law schools. Human rights are ignored while thought reform and mental manipulation are accepted practices used as behavior modification. Dr. Louis Jolion West comes to mind. Media and public scrutiny shows that United States mental hospitals are in fact destructive murder industries. Razor of Madness Expose Novel details this epidemic through an in-depth professional and personal investigation. For decades there has been a revolving door policy that still releases killers and pedophiles back into society. The maestro of mind control continues to haunt America to this very day. Razor of Madness is available in paperback or as a downloadable ebook at Amazon.com. I'm William S. Peckham. If you enjoy a good mystery with a touch of the paranormal, then you'll love my novel, From Out of the Woodwork. It's the story of a young Toronto contractor, Sean Kennedy, who buys derelict homes, guts them, and turns them into multifamily dwellings. Slums just waiting to happen. When Sean buys 29 Livery Lane, the house fights back. Former owners unexpectedly come out of the woodwork as he starts the destruction. The apparitions come to him when he touches old books, reads hidden letters, rummages through old boxes, finds a locket or reads a discovered manuscript of a murder mystery. From out of the woodwork, 
will take you from 1899 to the horror of the World Trade Center, September 11, 2001. Check out From Out of the Woodwork on my website, www.williamspeckham.com. Welcome to the fourth and final segment of Cal's Corner Radio Show here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. Once again, my name is Cal Korf. I am your host, and Rob McConnell is the executive producer of this show. Now, let's talk about Communist China and a game-changing development that has happened, which again is being underreported by most of the left-wing Lala liberal media They'd rather focus on bogus Russian scandal issues with President Trump and continue to bash him rather than focus on more important stories, which is how communist China continues to be and has now taken a huge step forward in destabilizing world peace. And let's prove it. Now, there's a saying that says, beware of smiling Chinese. Okay, there's a popular adage that says, again, beware of smiling Chinese. While Lala left-wing liberals, self-proclaimed progressives, and other apologists for China will wrongly dismiss this phrase as being, quote, racist, unquote, or politically incorrect, in reality, this expression is based on a very real and old Chinese phrase, and you'll have to excuse my terrible California Chinese accent here. It says, Zhao Mian Hu, and if you translate that into English, it means smiling tiger. Now, in Chinese culture, the concept of a smiling tiger is a powerful animal whose initial or outward appearance might seem at first to be benign or peaceful, but in reality, it cannot be trusted. For a smiling tiger can strike out at any time, and it is outright dangerous. Now, this analogy of the smiling tiger fits today's communist China perfectly. While its dictator, Xi Jinping, is the country's official smiling face, and he makes a point to smile often, make no mistake about it, Jinping rules China with a brutal iron fist. Indeed, ever since his steady, systematic, and ruthless rise to power, Jinping has now amassed for himself the greatest amount of power and control since communist founder and China's great leader, Mao Zedong. Now, where it concerns basic universal issues of freedom, China, for all practical purposes, has none, unless one chooses to ridiculously and stupidly define freedom as the right to do only what the state forces you to. Not only does China censor the Internet, even private bloggers are now required under Chinese law to clear their published content ahead of time with authorities. Failure to do so, or dare say the wrong thing, and you can be sentenced to a prison term of up to seven years at hard labor while you're being, quote, rehabilitated, unquote, which is really a euphemism for the word tortured in one of China's infamous prisons. Now, communist China views any other political party or system of government and basic liberties themselves all to be a threat to its very existence. Not surprisingly, there are now more journalists locked up and bloggers locked up in China's prisons than even in the country of Turkey. Now, shamefully, the United Nations does nothing about China's abuses and human rights violations. If a motion to try to hold China accountable is ever submitted to the stale and arguably outdated euphemistically called UN Security Council, China would just veto it anyway rendering the whole issue irrelevant. Now, to cite just two examples of China's extermination of what it considers to be existential threats, it is now outlawing Western-style rap music, and it continues to persecute the religion of Christianity. Yes, suddenly, rappers like Eminem and Snoop Dogg are threats to China in the twisted minds of its communist dictatorship. You can't make this stuff up, folks. Each year in China, Christian churches are blown up with explosives and destroyed. Communist China views the words of Jesus Christ as an existential threat. 
This is because what Christ and the Jewish religion of Judaism, from which Christianity is based, by the way, both advocate are universal concepts such as love, do not lie, do not steal, do not cheat, strive to be your absolute best, do not kill except in self-defense, treat people kindly, value truth, democracy, etc. It is therefore not a coincidence that China is the most corrupt nation on earth. It doesn't value intellectual property, and it is a belligerent and aggressive global threat. For if communist China started embracing genuine freedom and democracy, halted its corruption, valued the rule of law and universal human rights, freedom and democracy, its present totalitarian government would cease to exist. Now, it is also not a coincidence that history's greatest mass murderers are communists. Now, if you doubt this, Google it. China's self-proclaimed Chairman Mao is the greatest mass murderer in known history. He was even more genocidal than Nazi Germany's Adolf Hitler was. And Hitler started World War II and committed the Holocaust. Now, while official estimates vary because no one bothered to count the victims, nobody cared, Mao's madness murdered as many as 100 million people. Again, you can look this up. Now, not surprisingly, history's second greatest mass serial killer is Russia's former dictator Joseph Stalin, who once lorded over the former Soviet Union and almost all of Central and Eastern Europe during the decades of the Cold War. As with Mao, no one bothered to count the bodies of Stalin's victims. Estimates vary, but Stalin killed anywhere from 35 to 70 million people. Now, put another way, communism has murdered more people than any other modern era political system. Since pure communism cannot work, what China has done since Mao Zedong died is transform itself into a totalitarian capitalist dictatorship. Now, using money that it earns from the West, eagerly given to it by greedy companies who seek cheaply manufactured goods and labor, and do not genuinely care about human rights, despite their boasts to the contrary, communist China's business model is simple and shrewd. Take the money from the West, use it to destroy the West, and become the world's only superpower by the year 2050. Now, China really does have a grand plan to become the world's only superpower by 2050. What stands in its way at present are just two nations – the United States of America, which is presently the world's only superpower, and ironically, India, which is the world's largest, most superstitious, and shamefully corrupt democracy. Let's be blunt about it. Now, population-wise, India will surpass China by around the year 2040, which is why China is busy fast-tracking its efforts to modernize its military and put all of the key places, uh, pieces in place to not only start wars, but most importantly, contain and win them, which is a capability required of any superpower that it presently does not have. This is where China's new stealth fighter plays a vital role. Now, to be blunt, the communist Chinese did not invent the stealth fighter on their own. Instead, during the time that American President Barack Obama was in office for eight years, Defense-related computer systems were hacked by the Chinese military, and the entire engineering and design blueprints for the U.S.-made Joint Strike Fighter, or JSF, were stolen. To put this very bluntly, what passed for cybersecurity during the Obama administration was a bad joke at best. Now we come to the matter of India. India now has a new problem in that China is its enemy, let's be honest about it, and India doesn't have stealth anything. It doesn't exist. India can't even make a decent aircraft to compete with the Chinese military. India can't even make its own indigenously made assault rifle. Instead, it's now buying Tavor assault rifles from Israel. India spent millions of dollars and wasted seven years of time trying to make its own uh, assault rifle, and it couldn't do it. 
And that's just outright shameful, and it was due largely to corruption and incompetence. And let me prove how incredibly insane this is. Let's say you're going to invent an assault rifle because you want to make your own. Theoretically, if you can make your own, you don't have to be dependent on a foreign supplier, and you can theoretically make it cheaper, right? So let's say you want to make an assault rifle. The good news is you don't have to invent anything. It's already been done. The basic physics and mechanics of assault rifles have not changed in over 100 years. In fact, the grandfather of all these modern gas-powered weapons is the old, venerable 1911 Colt 45. It was invented in 1911. It's now 2018. You do the math on how many years that is. It's over 100 years. So all you have to do is get a barrel that's been invented for centuries. You get a trigger. You get a spring mechanism. You get a clip to hold the bullets. You buy the ammo. It's made by somebody else, or you can make your own bullets. India at least manages to do that. In other words, you don't have to reinvent any. You don't have to invent anything. You're just repackaging stuff that was long ago invented. And how hard is it to do that? Well, it's damn easy. If you go to Pakistan today, and anybody can do this, and you go to the area where it borders Afghanistan, you just tell them what weapon you want to make, give them a few rupees, and they'll make it for you while you wait. So if Pakistan can do it, an old man in a shop can sit there and put together an AK-47 for you, how hard can it be to invent a assault rifle? India is now in serious trouble. It has to get an answer to the threat from China, and it doesn't have it. And India, of course, now has to depend on foreign powers to get assistance because it can't defend itself on its own anymore unless it goes nuclear. That's how bad it is. Thanks for joining me. We'll be back next week with another episode of Cal's Corner here on the Exxon Broadcast Network. My name is Cal Korf, and I'm your host. Modern Esoteric, Beyond Our Senses by Brad Olson, consummates the lifeology story about where humanity originates. It is the lost continents, the primitive wisdom, the mythos of creation, and the rethinking of ancient history as we are taught in academia. There is much more to the story than what we have been told. As this is the first book in the Esoteric series, Modern Esoteric starts at the beginning of time and accelerates up to this modern age. Future Esoteric is book two in the series and takes a forward-looking position ahead of today with an open and honest examination of the ET issue and various unexplained phenomena. To discover the writings of author Brad Olson, visit www.bradolson.com. That's www.bradolson.com. Are you or is someone you know struggling with addictions, depression, anxiety, relationships, low self-esteem, lack of confidence, grief, success, and prosperity? Do you know that your subconscious belief plays a big role in the outcome of your hard work? We can help you permanently change the beliefs that may be the reason for your struggles and failures. We care about getting you the return on your investment and the results you are looking for. We can help you be free of the limitations of your past and in realizing your highest potential. We work with people by phone and Skype. For more information, visit us at www.ritasoman.com. That's www.ritasoman.com. Do you think you have energy problems in your home? Do you feel better when you're away than when you're home? Joey Korn is a global leader in the world of dowsing who specializes in personal energy clearing and space clearing. He can help you create an ideal energy environment in your home no matter where you live in the world. Learn about his remote spiritual house cleaning services and much more at www.dowsers.com. 
You can get Joey's book, Dowsing, A Path to Enlightenment, as well as other dowsing books and tools, Kabbalah books, and Walter Russell books. Joey's work is really amazing. Go to dowsers.com right now. That's D-O-W-S-E-R-S dot com or call 1-877-DOWSING. That's 1-877-369-7464.